Before I kick things off, quick introduction. Uh, my name is Margaret Schmidt. I'm the Director of Electronics Business Development at ANSYS. I've been with the company for 10 years, but I have been in the Silicon Valley for 18 years, watching the development of technology. I was a chip designer at Sun Microsystems. Probably shows how old I am. And I've uh, seen see a lot of the great foundation roots and backbones of the IoT being built over the last 18 years. So happy to talk with everyone tonight. And I'd like to really start us off uh, with a question. It's the Internet of Things. Are we there yet? Uh, I get that question. I got that question last week and from a very highly distinguished PhD in electrical engineering. And uh, you know, she said, Margaret, this, this Internet of Things, it's still hype. Is it real? And I'm happy, I'm happy to report that from, from where I'm sitting, my side of the fence, absolutely, uh, we are far beyond the hype. We are seeing a steady rollout of products that are poised to take advantage of what the IoT will enable. And I'm, I'm delighted to hear the pitches tonight. I heard some really great, the treadmill with the sensors, uh, the bed pad for monitoring the medical, uh, the, the camera that was monitoring the, uh, the uh, person working out. Great, great, great ideas. There's another one, I'm sorry, I'm giving you a little press time here. Uh, the, the mobile battery pack, the Pearl battery, great ideas there, perfectly poised to take advantage of the Internet of Things. But when we're talking about the Internet of Things, we're really talking about these, these objects, these, the, the things that we're connecting through a network. And these things need to integrate, you heard it tonight, you're integrating sensors, you're integrating antennas, you're, you're integrating everything you need to communicate with a gateway or network. And, of course, you're talking about the data that you're collecting from those sensors. And this is the data you're going to be running analytics on, looking for patterns, looking for a way to take some, some action, so, and a way to predict either a condition, maybe a failure. Maybe you're looking for uh, the sensors in that treadmill in the gate and looking to identify, hey, we can see that this person's arthritis in their hip or knee is getting worse because we can see the gate patterns trending. And we can tell that person, hey, we think you're five years away from a hip transplant, maybe, or a hip replacement, excuse me. Uh, so, tremendously exciting. But what I'm going to be really talking about, focusing on tonight, each one of these things, of course, is a, is a presentation in itself. I'm going to be focusing specifically for our hardware massive discussion on designing successful products for the Internet of Things and how you can use this to differentiate your product and your brand. Now, no presentation is complete without some <laughs> statistics. Okay, so by 2020, we're estimating about 20 billion devices connected to the internet. I have a hard time wrapping my head around a number like that. So this one helps me think about it. That's more than the number of people on the face of the earth, which means you're looking at more than one device, multiple devices for each human being on the face of the earth. And that's a big number for me to get my head around. So I like this one. This one comes from Gardner. Estimated in the year 2016, it's where we are, Five million devices are connected to the internet every day. That's opportunity. We are beyond the hype. <laughs> so the internet of things, it's here. We're there, but we're not at the end of the journey. And that's what I'd like to focus on tonight. But certainly as startups, as investors, if you can grab even a small percentage of this tremendous market, you're going to be in really great shape. So definitely tremendous motivation to, uh, to join this way and look at how to incorporate the IoT into your devices. Uh, now let's take a look. How did we get here? And I talked about being in the Silicon Valley for 18 years. And certainly we can all say it's the tremendous revolution in mobile devices. And looking at the processors that have fueled those mobile devices. Uh, certainly, unquestionably, our phones are way beyond phones. These are our daily assistants helping us navigate traffic. Well, believe me, without my mobile device, I never would have made it here tonight. Took several wrong turns. These are our daily assistants. You know, these, these aren't tools, these are really interfaces 
helping us take advantage of what's on the internet and what's, what's available to us. And thanks to this revolution, it drove a very strong infrastructure that is just even growing today, a wireless infrastructure for sharing this data that's available to us. It's a highway we can use with this traffic. And what's near and dear to my heart, the focus on power efficiency. I have to say that because I'm an electrical engineer. Uh, but uh, this is tremendous. This is tremendous because I remember not so many years ago, seven years ago maybe, talking to companies about, uh, you know, shouldn't you be looking to make your chip more power efficient? Don't you want to consume less power? And I would get, oh, don't worry, we plug it to the wall. We're fine. <laughs> and I was like, you're plugging it to the wall, but you're consuming power. No, <laughs> save the planet. Um, but this, this is huge now. What is, okay, so what does this mean? Obviously, we don't want to save power. But what does it mean to the IoT? Think about it. Think about it. the pill you swallow that's going to transmit maybe information about the pH balance in your stomach for some sort of diagnostic, or maybe your baby monitor sitting, sitting on the child's bed, or, or any type of device that's always on, a pacemaker, for example, that has, has to be always on and reliable is consuming power. And you don't want to be dependent on constantly needing to charge or, or replace batteries. And so what this is, is it's driving even a revolution in our, our power. We're looking at wireless charging. We're looking at energy harvesting to, to power these always on devices. Especially, I know, talking with several people, I know a lot of people are interested in medical device development. This is one of the huge areas I think is really growing. So definitely seeing the trend to energy efficient devices. And certainly as devices are smart, we're having a lot of embedded control software, a lot of, a lot of many, many hundreds of thousands of lines of code uh, that need to be written. And they need to be written in a safe and secure fashion. Now, now probably many of you are capable of doing that, running 10,000 lines of codes that are error free. I assure you, I am not. <laughs> so very, very key. Uh, and of course, to top it all off, looking at all of these challenges, the, the main challenge is you've got to get all of this into smaller and smaller footprints. Remember that pacemaker? Remember that pill you were going to swallow? Small form factors, key to enabling this internet of things. Now, let's talk about IoT product development. Now, when you look at the evolution of product design, the Internet of Things is not necessarily introducing new products. It's changing the value proposition of existing products. Let's take a car, for example. It's one of the hottest areas of IoT development at all today. And you look at how um, you know, this technology is, is changing in a disruptive fashion the value proposition of a car. So 10 years ago, we all went to buy cars. Uh, you took a look at a car, you looked at the engine, and you looked at the brand, you looked at the interior, nice leather seats, and you said, ah, oh, okay, that's, that's a differentiator for me. Nowadays, you look at advanced driver assistance, you look at infotainment, you look at the safety, you look at the autonomous features. If you're me, you look at parallel parking assist, because I'm terrible at it. And this is what is now driving the value and distinguishing a brand for a company. And what does this mean? The car has become evolved to the smart product. We put processors in there, we put sensors, we put cameras for safety features. And in smart and connected, we're implementing antennas, vehicle to vehicle communication. I'm already starting to see a lot of this being tested out. So the prediction is by 2020, you're looking at 50% of a car's bill of materials being um, electronic components. And that's tremendous. Think about it. 50%. It's $20,000. It is a wonder for us as consumers. It's a nightmare for the engineers. And uh, I'd like to explore a little bit of that coming up in my talk. Before we get there, what I'd like to highlight here is we're really on the brink of a disruption in how we define the value propositions of these products and how we're doing business. So if you look at all of these disruptive stages of our industry, you can see we're really at the threshold of the fourth industrial revolution. 
What started in the 80s and 90s with the computer, uh, computers, automation, robotics, we're now taking a step forward because now we're putting sensors, we're collecting data about the efficiency of these machines, and we're going to be able to create smart manufacturing, smart factories, we're going to be able to create not just better products, but we're going to create more efficient workflows. And this is really, um, you know, if you look on, uh, look on the articles, look in the news, you're seeing this is a huge growth area in focus today. Um, so tre tremendous um, future, forward-looking technology. You can see that the Internet of Things is not just going to stop with uh, developing the device, but rather the manufacturing. Okay, so let's start with talking about challenges for designing these IoT devices. Now, does anyone recognize what this is? Probably can't read those, those footnotes there. Yeah, it's the Facebook drone. It's the Facebook drone. Now, of course, you know, Facebook business is connecting people. Um, Facebook is looking to provide internet service to remote areas via these, these drones. And probably the first thing you're thinking about is, well, um, I don't really see how this is an IoT device, but you know, keep in mind this is you know, the infrastructure providing that gateway and network. But let's take a look at it as an engineering challenge. Okay? This is, uh, they'd like to fly this for about three months at a time. Wingspan of a 737, pretty biggish. Uh, weighs less than a car. Uh, solar powered. Okay, so I'm a design engineer trying to tackle this. Keep in mind, you know, we've got to provide this internet service, so we're looking, you know, considerable electronics. We're looking at weight, we've got to keep this aloft. So we've got a size and weight compromise we're going to have to make here. We're looking at power efficiency, we want it to be solar powered and we want it to fly every three months at a time. Definitely looking at power efficiency. And let's, you know, get into the whole challenges of operation. Flying, maybe it's a cold temperature, maybe it's landing, maybe it's going to sit in the parking lot of the desert for a while. It's going to be hot, cold. These are, I had a great, uh, great conversation in the beginning um, of our meeting tonight about keep in mind whenever you're talking about vehicles, cars, airplanes, drones, you're talking zero tolerance for failure. This is not a cell phone that, you know, if you're not happy with the performance, you throw away and get the other cell phone. This is any failure in these systems uh, that results in any catastrophic, goes off course, crashes, whatever, is going to potentially result in loss of life. And that's going to be one of the key engineering challenges that I can see going forward. How do you ensure that zero loss, uh, zero tolerance for failure going forward? And this is the challenge of these design engineers. And on top of it all, on top of all of these challenges that they're working on, they're working traditionally in silos. Mechanical engineers may be looking at structural integrity. They may be looking at the form. They may be looking at the weight, size. Electrical engineers focused here on sensors, antennas, electronics, power efficiency. Thermal engineers may be taking a look at, okay, you know, let's take a look at it, make sure we've got sufficient cooling solutions, that it's light enough. But working together, they can create a more optimized design. Traditionally, they haven't been. They've been using different tools, they're using different types of models, even different stages of the design. Uh, so that's the underlying engineering challenge. Not only do you have to satisfy all these criteria, but you can't do it alone. Collaboration is key. Uh, so how are companies doing this? How are companies collaborating and creating these innovative new products? Because keep in mind, if you've been developing, maybe you've been developing planes the whole time. Maybe you've been de developing cars the whole time. But now you're making them IoT ready, so you have to put antennas in. Not everyone in the company may have been an antenna designer. Maybe you're not an expert. Maybe you're trying to create your IoT device for the very first time, make it connected, get an antenna off the shelf, you put it on, and you hope it works. Hope the first version works. And sure, you can build maybe 10 of those, and you can test them out in different conditions, but how do you know you hit the worst case condition? How do you know you reached an optimized product? You reached an endpoint that worked, but maybe it could work better. So let's take a look at how some companies 
develop these optimized products. Not just an antenna, not just a sensor, maybe not just a chip, but they designed the entire system. And here's a few examples, and pull this, some of these examples from various industries, um, from defense, from health and wearables, uh, from aerospace, automotive in industry. And I won't read them all out, I just want to highlight a few of these that are kind of near and dear to my heart, and that actually I think might be relevant based on some of the, uh, the earlier pitches tonight. You know, taking a look at a wearable device. So ensuring that that wearable device gives you the connectivity you need to be reliable, wherever it's being worn on the body, on the wrist, on the head, maybe it's clipped on, and ensuring that it's not generating radiation that could damage the body, but giving you the connectivity you need for real-time performance. Uh, this is a neat one from Medtronic, actually looking at how can you remotely charge an embedded medical device without impacting the patient and, and, and actually damaging their skin. Great, great application for simulation here because you can work on validating that and testing it without actually injuring any patients. Great application for a simulation. Here's another one. We talked about generating those endless lines of code automatically for these control systems for a drone uh, from Piaggio. Okay, who knows, test question, who knows what Piaggio is famous for, at least what I think Piaggio comes, brings into my mind. Anyone know? Talking about entrepreneurship. Oh no, you can't possibly know. I Scooters. Thought that was Scooters. Vespa, exactly. Yeah. Talk about entrepreneurship. Piaggio actually invented the Vespa as a cheap, efficient, rugged way uh, to get around Rome. And uh, that's, I can't believe anyone knew that. <laughs> uh, so you see, they've been innovating for quite a long time. And however, using simulation uh, to, to help them uh, generate uh, the these efficient autonomous systems. Okay, last one. This, this one's my favorite, near and dear to my heart. And, and, and you're, gonna give me some, you're gonna give me some questions on this one. This is basically a pump design from Grundfos. And you're going to say, Margaret, what is pump doing as an IoT device? Well, think about it. It's very interesting. Grundfos uh, has found that 10% uh, of the world's energy consumption is being used by pumps. 10% by pumps. So if you're trying to implement a smart factory or a smart manufacturing process and you're not looking at creating more efficient pumps, well that's not very smart, is it? <laughs> so I think it's very much uh, the backbone of what the, the uh, internet of industrial things is going to be based on. Uh, so just you know, some examples of how you can use simulation uh, to to create these optimized, and again, not products, not just one component, but the whole system in its target environment, inside the body, being worn on the body. Uh, looking at um, you know, it, its operation, maybe in different temperatures, for example, different speeds. Now, of course, uh, being from ANSYS, we're a simulation company, uh, 46 years old. And so you may think, well, okay, Margaret, you know, you're a simulation company, of course you're talking about simulations. Don't take my word for it. I have an independent study here from uh, Aberdeen Group, and this is actually rather interesting. You know, we all have engineering degrees, mechanical, electrical, bachelor's, master's, PhDs. We all have access to many tools, right? Talk to many people today uh, in the industry. Do software engineers count as engineers? Yes. Yes, they do. Only because he's so close. I have to say that. <laughs> It's and a, you know, it's a big misconception. I think that is a great point yeah. that engineering for the IoT is as much a hardware and software engineering challenge. I'm not just saying that to be politically correct, but this group. <laughs> uh, no, it absolutely is. And you saw that example from Piaggio and from Subaru with, with some of the uh, um, uh, embedded code generation. Uh, but what I'm saying is the playing field is pretty level, right? Greg was mentioning earlier, um, startups worldwide, right? We're all really well-trained engineers. So why are some companies more successful than others? If they have access to the same tools, access to the same engineering talent, what are they doing better? And what they found was the companies most likely to succeed were taking this holistic approach to simulation. 
So they really saw value in helping their engineers collaborate, provide them access to, uh, to this workflow that gets them out of their silos. And they found that these exactly were the companies um, with less development time, faster development time, um, they had less turnarounds, less respins, re and they were uh, more likely to be successful. And as a matter of fact, they found that almost 40% of the respondents said lack of collaboration was one of their biggest challenges they faced every day. So definitely, the, what's distinguishing successful companies is the ability to simulate. And the ability to simulate, again, not just on a product, uh, I mean, not just on a component, but at the system level. And at ANSYS, we call that the concept of virtual system prototyping. And that is simulating, simulating that antenna on that board, that board on a car, and how the performance looks and whether or not you know, you're know you being power efficient, how much heat you're generating. We simulate the entire effect of the system. Now, I can't take credit for this. This is actually um, an idea that came from our founder. And this is, this is my only ANSYS slide. <laughs> um, ANSYS, I mentioned, was 46 years old. We are a simulation company. Uh, we were founded in, uh, or our roots go back to uh, Pittsburgh in the 1970s. And as you can see, like many Silicon Valley startups, our beginning was in a garage. Actually, we don't even have a garage. <laughs> All we have is a parking lot. Um, <laughs> but our founder was John Swanson. Uh, John Swanson was a PhD from the University of Pittsburgh, and he went to work for Westinghouse. And his, his job was building physical prototypes, testing them, and going on to the next physical prototyping, and using this to optimize the process. And John Swanson had an idea. There has to be a better way. And he came up with some of the first virtual simulations prototype ideas at Westinghouse and saw tremendous value in being able to optimize rapidly without costly physical prototypes, long test times, uh, and, and limited, uh, limited ability to, to optimize these pro products. And he would eventually leave Westinghouse and found his own company based on the idea of using simulation for virtual system prototyping. And, uh, you know, that takes us up to present day. Uh, our headquarters is still in Pittsburgh, and we are a, I didn't touch anything, I don't know why I did that. Um, uh, we are a, uh, well, no, correct me, $1 billion company. Yep, $1 Thank you. And, okay, so that was my, my intro on ANSYS. Uh, just to show you that uh, we are a startup. 46-year-old <laughs> startup. Okay, well, let's do a deep dive. So we talked about we're designing an optimized product for the Internet of Things. We talked about the challenges, size, weight, cooling, the ability to connect to the Internet, to sense the data, and uh, design for the conditions your, your device is going to be in. Um, maybe for the treadmill, you know, the constant impact, looking at that, looking at how thick specific layers have to be, how much padding needs to be there for certain conditions. Uh, just just kind of highlight an application there. Now, these are the challenges. The applications we've seen in our experience are in the development, of course, of the embedded electronic components in these IoT devices. And that is from the very processors, the packages, their boards, and the entire cooling solutions around these. And then on top of that, of course, the antennas we're placing for connectivity, the sensors we need to integrate. Several people mentioned integrating sensors into their designs, where to place them. Uh, looking at power thermal management of the entire device. This can severely impact your cost, your weight, your reliability, and that also brings us back to that zero tolerance for failure we were talking about before as well. Thermal can have a tremendous impact both on your electrical as well as your structural uh, integrity. Uh, talk about the need for uh, uh, zero failure embedded uh, code to be generated automatically. It's another area of application, especially for the autonomous systems or human-machine interfaces, um, as well as the, the ruggedized design development. So I'm just going to kind of walk through these in a few examples. 
as areas where simulation can help you achieve an optimized design in each one of these areas. I just kind of look through a few examples here. I'm just going to kind of uh, page through these in the area of that chip package system design, antenna placement, sensor integration and optimization, power efficiency, ruggedization, and some of the autonomous and system development. And I really just kind of, especially for the audience we have here tonight, maybe just want to highlight, I'll just pick one of these. Um, Synapse, you may know, is the company that uh, uh, developed a smart band, Nike Fuel Band. And it's a very interesting application that you, know, you all may find relevant if you're doing something wearable. And that is, if you're integrating an antenna on a wearable, it's very much affected by the placement of the antenna and the human body. So you want to go ahead and analyze what's the effect of um, SAR radiation on the body. And you also want to take a look at how strong that field is emanating from the, the band or the headband or the ankle band or, or what have you. And that's something you can do easily with simulation. You can actually, we have a human body model you can take. You can place uh, the antenna on the board or, or around the band and take a look at the strength of the field. Uh, very straightforward to do with simulation, especially if you're optimizing that design for performance and connectivity. Okay, just a few examples, but since we're all engineers here tonight, uh, I'd like to uh, go ahead and just do a breakdown on an application, certainly very relevant application for IoT in the area of safety and security. And I picked, a, a, actually this is, this is a project done by our technical team in San Jose. Uh, it's a search and rescue drone. Great application here to kind of tear these down one by one. And these drones need to operate in harsh environments, certainly temperature as well as structurally a harsh environment. You know, a lot of, lot of uh, potentially debris or forests. You can imagine these might have to go through extreme weather conditions. And of course, they're supposed to be taking high resolution images. That means cameras, cameras heat up. You need to design the camera. You're gonna have processors there for storage, for um, data processing. And of course, you're gonna want that to not be impacted by temperature. So great application here to kind of look at IoT and uh, certainly kind of taking a look at the drone. What do we need to design in addition to ruggedization, power efficiency? We're simulating here the communication with the base station, base, the base station and satellite here. And certainly we want to simulate, we want to optimize this drone, but we want to optimize its performance in the environment, make sure it's not being impeded uh, by any type of interference here in the environment so that our drone comes back to us safely. And I mean, this, this is, I mean, I'm talking about Internet of Things is here. This is being used in real time. Um, this, is, uh, this is actually uh, footage from the uh, Nepal earthquake. And the drones have been very effective to go in buildings and kind of help find, uh, locate people, as well as kind of get in a feeling of how damaged that building is and whether it's safe. Uh, safe to enter. Now, again, this is where these engineers are coming out of their silos. Everything I just talked about involves multiple physics. If you're looking at the antenna, that antenna, you need to take a look at the heat impact. That heat impact then in turn can have an impact on your structural integrity. It can actually cause deformation. Uh, so this is, this is where your electrical, mechanical, and thermal engineers can collaborate. And they can take models and they can run through the various analysis and they can determine, am I power efficient? Uh, am I you know, have the heat? Is it causing deformation of my board? Is it causing a deformation of my antenna? Structural integrity. Um, all, this, is, this is essentially the workflow that these engineers, just a few examples here, uh, looking at the antenna placement. Where do I place my antenna? And do I place it here? Do I place it here? Is there an advantage? especially since I'm communicating with base stations and satellites. Oops. Taking a look at airflow here through the propellers, taking a look at the, the thermal signatures. I'll just, I'll just get through this animation here. There we go. And, I, and again, the performance and, and uh, reliability of that drone and its connectivity in an actual environment. How is that drone going to behave if it's flying between skyscrapers, for example? Are you going to lose connectivity to that drone? Are you going to lose some sort of uh, reliability for that device? 
And taking it a step further, I know I've got an electrical engineer in this audience, so there's, there's the, my electrical engineer there. Um, if you're designing that uh, drone to be able to communicate that antenna at a specific band and frequency, uh, you need to go and actually optimize that antenna, its placement on the board, take a look at, make sure it's low noise, uh, and make sure it's well balanced so it's power efficient. So this is an area where you can easily simulate and validate uh, that that design is going to work. And you can go through multiple iterations. It doesn't cost you anything because it's simulation. You don't need to build anything. Um, I heard, I was at a conference yesterday in uh, UC Irvine and the topic was uh, driving innovation with simulation. And one of the uh, engineers from uh, Southern California, Signal Integrity, uh, told the audience, I validate in the lab. I don't design in the lab. Okay, you design with simulation. You validate in the lab. I thought that was a great quote. I had to use that. I did not, I take no credit for that. That <laughs> came from the presenter yesterday. Um, and again, for my mechanical engineers, I heard many mechanical engineers uh, raising their hand. I mean, definitely, you know, you're looking at size, weight, you're looking at heat. How can heat impact you? Taking a look at airflow, um, validating what happens when bad stuff happens. What happens if a rock falls on it? What happens if it hits the tree? What happens if it hits the corner of that damaged building? Are things going to start flying off? What can you do to make it uh, make it more resilient? And this is, folks, this is where things get exciting because you can always build a physical prototype. Many times you, you know, first product, you know, first proof of concept, something you put together. But then you can, you can have fun with it and say, okay, how thin could I make that arm so it's really light, really light, but still sturdy? How could I find that out? You're not going to buy a, a lot of different materials, cut them out, try and test different sizes. You can do that all with simulation. And you can come up with the thinnest, thinnest arm you can get the lightest with the best, uh, the best strength or weight, whatever it is you're optimizing for. That's where simulation helps you. It helps you zero in on the optimized, the optimized parameters for that design. And this is what makes us excited. And finally, you know, you're taking a look at the performance of that drone, communicating with that base station, communicating with that satellite, and looking at the various interferences in the environment. And I'm using a drone here, folks. This could be anything. This could be a car. Uh, this could be any of your smart devices. This could be an RFID or, or some sort of you know, wearable medical lab that you're taking out to a remote area. Um, RFIDs uh, you know, in a car going through a toll road and looking at interference. Um, you know, this is, could certainly be any application that you're developing. OK. I'd like to pause there, because we've been talking the whole time about implementing your IoT device. And you can use various examples here we've talked about tonight, a lot, of, a lot of fitness, a lot of wearable applications I've heard about. And you can use simulation to optimize its connectivity, optimize its ability to co collect data, last longer, and you can use it to make it lower cost or lower weight, which you're optimizing for. Now, is that the end of where the Internet of Things is going to help you? Just connecting to the Internet? Is that, is that the end of the story? And absolutely it's not. Imagine that you're developing something. Uh, let's say you're uh, developing the, the next electric bike. Okay, come up with a great concept. Electric bike is going to be outfitted for IoT, so you can put sensors on it, and maybe you're monitoring you know, a person's heart rate or something through that electric bike. I'm making this up, pure, purely fictional. And you get funding, and you start production, and you sell 10,000 bicycles, and your business is off and running. It's great. It's I, IoT application. What else can you use the IoT for? Well, essentially, you just sold 10,000 models you can use data from to optimize your bike design. So you can, you can have sensors in that bike that relay information back to you so that that virtual prototype that you used for design can be optimized. Maybe when you designed it, you didn't think of this one condition. Oh, what if it's taken down gravelly mountain roads every day for five days? Maybe you didn't simulate for that. Maybe you didn't think about that case. And that is the idea 
of the digital twin. So the idea of the digital twin is that you are creating a complete virtual system prototype that performs and reacts, behaves just like the physical prototype. Where can that come into place? Well, first of all, if this is an expensive device, expensive system, uh, and you're investigating modes of failure, so you want to understand how this fails, you certainly don't want to break it. If it costs $100,000, $500,000, a million dollars, you don't want to break this just to understand what a failure looks like. It's much easier to take a model, simulate it, and understand the mode of failure there. So that's the concept of the digital twin where we're simulating the entire system and the way it performs. Let's take an example. Take an example of a pump. Pump, you know, we've got a motor here, we've got some turbines, we've got some shafts. If we want to understand how this will fail in the case of the shafts not aligning, we don't want to go do that on the physical, physical um, product. We're going to have to pay for that. It's costly. It may not show us all the modes of failure. We want to go and simulate. Very easy to misalign those shafts on your digital twin. Simulate that, and then you'll see the modes of failure from, from that shaft alignment. Maybe you'll see parts, you know, parts wearing out more pressure, for example, on that device. And that is the whole concept of that holistic simulation we're talking about. The holistic simulation of looking at the electrical, thermal, uh, and structural behavior of, of that product. Uh, this, this, of course, is going to have some pretty uh, tremendous, uh, tremendous applications for your business. Um, one is just looking at lifetime of your product. If you're able to simulate a various failure modes, you're going to be able to see how parts are going to wear out faster. Part number two, for those parts that wear out faster, you're going to be able to predict with those sensors which parts are most likely nearing that type of um, kind of prescriptive service uh, requirement. So for example, go back to my electric bike example. If you've got sensors on that bike and you've simulated, okay, this, these, these, and these, when I see these, these, and these types of patterns showing up, I know I'm very close to the brake pads being too thin and actually failing. And that's something you can do that's actually a very I think a very exciting application coming up is that we can identify parts of the design likely to fail based on signatures from digital sensors. Let me explain that in detail. We're taking our digital twin, we're simulating it and we're introducing failure modes. Maybe it's a, uh, maybe it's a turbine and we're introducing cavitation. cavitation, so air bubbles coming through the turbine. Uh, we can identify with our digital sensors what, what those signals look like when that failure mode happens. So when it happens in the real world and we detect those actual signals that match that failure mode we identified, now we know, okay, the cause, cause is most likely this type of failure. We've already simulated it. We know what this, the sensor signals look like. We could just apply that to what we're actually monitoring from the factory that we've inter integrated sensors in. And this is what blows my mind, because not only can I predict when parts are most likely to fail, this is huge, this is huge for any industrial application, because it's very expensive to take anything out of service and fix it if it doesn't need to be fixed. Likewise, it's very expensive if a part, part, part breaks, but you actually could have predicted that it needed to be serviced a month in advance. And that's where this predictive and prescriptive maintenance is going to be made possible with the data analytics coming from these types of sensors. And listening to everyone's pitch tonight, especially in the area of, of the medical devices, I can't help but think there's, there's tremendous opportunity. Say, say you were monitoring children in their crib. Maybe you had sensors under a pad uh, for, for that child. And maybe you could monitor sleep patterns, you could monitor pressure. Maybe you've got that camera looking at the position of the child uh, on the bed. I'm thinking that you, know, you could take a look at the data and you could alert the parents you know, if there's any, any change in the heart rate. Maybe they're not lying in the right position or there's any foreign object in that bed. 
You know, maybe, okay, there's a blanket, there's a toy, there's a teddy bear, whatever, that might be a health hazard for that child, then that could be identified. And certainly, patterns of sleep, if you see certain patterns of sleep, that could trigger analytics to highlight, okay, you know, maybe the child's sick, maybe it's not feeling well, maybe it has a fever, alerting the parents to look at that. I think there's a lot of opportunity here with this digital uh, signatures made possible by a fast, easy, cheap way of implementing a virtual prototype versus you know, the, the real world object. And that's where it's going to take us into the fun stuff. Certainly our, our, our legal representatives tonight are going to appreciate. Okay, Margaret, um, you just told me you're collecting my health data. You're, connected, you're collecting um, uh, you know, all this information about my users, riding bicycles, driving in cars, maybe exceeding the speed limit. Um, you know, you're just telling me you've got all this data about maybe maybe a, a security critical type of factory uh, that, that might be a target. So you're telling me there's all this great data, who owns it? Who owns it? And whoever you, owns it can make use of the analytics. Where should the data be stored? Should the data be stored on site? Should it be in the cloud? And certainly you're seeing a lot of interest in, in what's basically you know, the edge computing, and that means you know, basically this data is staying on site. If it's a nuclear power plant or something like that, certainly then it's probably mode of operation. But there's a lot of open legal questions. I mean, just look at um, automotive uh, infotainment and advanced driver assist. Who owns that? You know, is it the end car company? Is it going to be whoever's providing the infotainment system? What's going to be the legal access to that? So certainly there are more challenges to engineering the IoT that I'm going to talk about tonight. We've got several legal representatives. They can, uh, they can weigh in after the talk, definitely. Um, but this, this, and this is certainly a growing space. You know, again, this is a presentation in itself, talking about cloud computing. But I'm here talking about how these challenges are changing the, the face of engineering. And, you know, I, I, I like to kind of talk about the journey that we've had. You know, certainly there's a number of us who've been in uh, engineering simulation for a while. And, and I have to say that, you know, back then, you know, it was the PhDs in the room, it was the three PhDs in the company that did the simulation, and came, up with, and came up with the ideas, or maybe it was this guy with his computing here. Uh, that was how it was done. You know, Baldo, you probably remember. You remember? I was there. I was there. I, I was there. I actually was that guy. I was there. <laughs> <laughs> like, you look much happier. <laughs> you look much happier now, definitely. Uh, but how can we innovate in that model if everyone's in a silo and ideas aren't get, getting exchanged? And that's why we are so excited to be here at Hardware Massive because this is where ideas are getting exchanged. You know, we're sharing, I learned so much already from everyone's pitch. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you guys afterwards. Uh, but we need more than just the three PhDs collaborating. Okay, we need engineers collaborating. We need non-analysts collaborating. We need designers, okay? We need designers collaborating. They need to be working on, um, working on chassis designs. They need to be working on form factors. Uh, they need to be maybe doing some early simulation on their own and giving it over to the engineers and say, hey, I think this is going to work. Not only is it beautiful, not only is it great, not only can it be light, uh, but I think this could be our next-gen product. And then the engineers say, yeah, you know, I can make that work. I can get a package and a chip into that. We can get a cooling solution in there. This is the only way collaboration is going to happen. And as Greg said at the beginning, this is not a Silicon Valley phenomenon. This is global. Um, I have to make a plug for Berlin, where I studied uh, electrical engineering. Um, certainly, you know, consider ourselves one of the, if not the main, startup <laughs> hub of Europe. A uh, little plug there for Berlin. And it's global. As Greg mentioned, it's not hard to collaborate globally anymore. And definitely want to make use of that and share that. But certainly the model has changed. You know, Waldo, I'm glad you're much happier now in your current role. You look very sad there. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and, and it's not just us talking startup, you know, startup initiatives and startup ideas. Companies like Bosch are taking leaps forward. Please, 
After the talk tonight, uh, take a look at Bosch's smart factories and a lot of their IoT initiatives. A lot of great companies with IoT initiatives out there. Just a great example of um, you know, companies moving forward, established companies moving forward with this idea. Uh, so to answer the question, engineering the IoT, the IoT, are we there yet? I'm going to quote my manager, Waldo. We are at the beginning of the beginning. This is the most exciting time. This is where there's tremendous amount of infrastructure available to us to use. But it's really up to us to collaborate, share ideas, and you know, to adopt best practices. And uh, you know, we have considerable experience working with startups, working with established companies, getting those products out there, getting them out there, and optimized for optimal user experience and optimal IoT experience. And, uh, and I'll just wrap it up and say, if you're interested in that uh, Aberdeen study, we do have that ebook available online, as well as various, we're, we're on YouTube, we're on various videos online, if you'd like to read more. And of course, we'll be here. ANSYS team, um, Waldo Rodriguez, Will Schultz over there, say hi. Uh, where is David Arnold? David? Right here. Uh, there he is, <laughs> hiding in the back. Matt, wave, say hi. ANSYS team is here if you have any questions. Hardware Massive, thank you so much for this opportunity. It was delightful. Thank you. <laughs>